Welcome back to the Mulpix podcast. It's been a long time and we've had some changes. Giorgio and Hannah have left on the podcast recording team, though Hannah continues to support us behind the scenes. Joining us today are two new members of the team, Spencer Winter and Nuhia Idipuganti. As always, I'm Eric Poppleton. And I'm Boya Wang. In today's episode, we wanted to reintroduce ourselves and introduce our new team members to the audience. Spencer and Nuhia, welcome. Hello, nice to be here. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. Awesome. Like, thank you guys so much for joining us and having the enthusiasm to join the podcast. Um, so I wanted to start with just like the basic questions. So um, let's start with Spencer. Who are you? Where are you? And what is it that you work on with respect to molecular programming? Well, hi, I'm Spencer. I'm a first year PhD student in bioengineering at Caltech. I work in the Chen lab and I work on reconfigurable DNA robots. And Anuhia? I'm a third year PhD student in mechanical engineering. I'm at the I'm at the Microsystems and Mechanobiology Lab uh, with Dr. Taylor as my advisor. And I work on multi-component assembly of DNA origami. Super exciting to have you guys. And for, for me and Boya, so Boya, where are you now? And what's changed since the last time you kind of introduced yourself on the podcast? Um Right now, I am a postdoc working with Lulu Chen, and um, my research is right now focused on programming, still focusing on programming equilibrium in molecular system, but with a kinetic control, with a better kinetic control. Um, I think when um, when I started, uh, last time when I talked in Mopix, I think that was Oh, introducing myself, that was four years ago when Mopix just started. And that was the time when I just graduated from graduate school. And um, I was implementing some changes in myself. And when I saw Hannah's recruitment on one of DNA conference, I was pretty excited. Um, I thought that there could be a lot of things um, helping graduate students especially I was at that stage just graduated from get my uh, just got my degree right now um, four years have passed I did see a lot of changes in me by doing trying small things little by little and I am now in a happier state of myself and trying to ready to explore all different things yeah I'm very, very glad to have you this whole time um, and I guess for me I when, when did I even join Mulpigs? was it two years ago in 2022? Do you remember, Boya? Sorry, I don't. I, I think I've been here for two years. Um, and yeah, so back then, I was a PhD student at Arizona State. These days, I'm a postdoc um, at a lot of different institutes in Heidelberg, Germany. Um, but I've kind of switched from the, you know, kind of software development side of molecular programming um, toward more actually trying to apply the software tools that I previously developed, as well as other tools within the molecular simulation community, um, to how we design and understand RNA nanotechnology structures. So in my previous work, kind of on DNA and building software to build out DNA. Um, and so kind of a question for everybody, like where do you guys, what do you guys think Molpigs has accomplished and what do you want to see Molpigs do more of in the future? Oh, I can take this question first. Uh, because I'm the most recent joinee. And to be very honest, I only found out about Mopigs like a couple months ago when my coworker was like, look at this cool little reading group that people are doing. And on it, I saw like an ad for like another like committee member. And this kind of involvement I'm really excited to do. So I'm not really sure uh, how Mopigs has changed over the year, but from my perspective, it does seem like a really like active community of uh, people wanting to read together or people listening to these cool podcasts um, and like people wanting to meet up and people wanting to connect with other people. So I see a lot of potential events for networking maybe. Uh, but yeah, that's my perspective. How about you, Spencer? I'm kind of in the same boat. We were separated by about a week, I think, for joining the team. Um, and similarly, I'm a very new person to the field. I think the thing that Molpigs really has that other groups don't is it really brings the human element to the field. It is, it definitely feels more 
social, I would say, than other things I had seen out there. And I think that that connection, especially for a smaller, lesser known field, is extremely important. This is something that I really like even before I joined the team um, is I felt like the podcast really put a like nice human face on the researchers doing the research. And you got to know both like their struggles um, as well as kind of the things that go on behind the scenes that like lead to these papers that are, you know, blow your mind with how much cool engineering you can do at the nanoscale. Um, so I really, really appreciated that from the perspective of a new researcher, because I wanted to know what kind of people are doing this. Can I see myself doing this kind of research? So for me, like the, the podcast is really the most humanizing element. And like, I also love the reading groups. I love this like excuse to read really cool fundamental papers that like maybe I passed over in the past because they weren't like directly applicable to what I was doing, but it's a good to have like the fundamentals. What do you think, Boya? I'm very happy to hear all of your responses. And this reminds me of the very early times when Mopic just started, when Hannah, Giorgio, and Anastasia and me, we four people were brainstorming what kind of activity we could do. I think we four joined the teams because we sharing the same drive that we would like. There might be something missing in our own research group that we didn't get. And we really hope that we emphasize that probably there are many other students who also need something when they are on their PhD journey. I'm very happy to hear that what we did and promoted what Mopic to do really helped. I did some um, beneficial things, like Spencer and Anu here said. Um, I'm very ha happy to hear that. Um, I think that's point out the core thing that uh, we Mopics would like to do is to have some connections, which a lot of graduate students missing that in their own research group. That kind of segues into the next question I have queued up here which is what were the skills that like got you to where you are today? We, we talked about, you know, there might be skills that your group is missing that you want to learn from the rest of the community. And that's why it's important that we have this option for community connection. Um, but what are the skills that you bring both for yourself and for the community that both drive your own professional trajectory forward as well as that you can contribute? Let's go Spencer first. Going to start with a person who's uh, done this for the least amount of time. I think it makes perfect exactly. sense. Exactly. Um, I really think that the number one thing that got me here was just simply a willingness to try. Um, I came from a no-name uh, undergraduate university. Um, I didn't originally think I was going to have the opportunity to do STEM. I didn't even think originally I was going to be able to go to college. And so uh, by really just being willing to put myself out there and being willing to try things and apply for things and being able to handle the possibility of rejection, I think that's really the number one thing to get anywhere. Uh, I'd like to echo everything you're saying because um, it's really the trying to get yourself out of your comfort zone that's bringing you new opportunities. But I'd like to add one thing to that, which is being comfortable with being not comfortable for a little bit, whether that's like joining a new group, uh, like taking on a new responsibility. There's going to be like a month where you just feel like the least experienced, least knowledgeable, like maybe like even stupid. But it's like you have to be comfortable with feeling that way for a little bit and then like learn to pick things up, ask stupid questions, uh, not be embarrassed. Uh, all of these things just really help you like put yourself out there, let people see you and let people connect with you. And also that element of vulnerability. So when people see that in you, that you're open about these experiences, I think they also want to connect with you. So that's sort of been my approach to like, sort of leveling up career-wise, I guess? I mean, for me, I think it's the ability to kind of grab opportunities and let the chaos of life kind of guide you towards where you are right now. I mean, I, I think I've told this story on the podcast before, but I went into grad school thinking I was going to do like analytical chemistry on soils. I, I did not think I would end up where I was at all, but it was because of a series of kind of chance stumblings on websites and um, making decisions to just cold email people that I am where I am today. And so it's that willingness to 
identify opportunities and then build off of them. And like Anuhia said, like when you start something new, like you have no idea what's going on. I did not know how to program really when I started in Peter Schultz lab. Um, I picked that up as I went. I sometimes will like find bits of code I wrote in like my first six months in the lab, but they're awful. Um, and now like I feel pretty confident in what I do. And I think that that's really been an important skill in getting this. And just like hard skills, like learn to program, it'll make your life a lot easier. And Boya, you're our, you know, elder statesman here. What, what do you think? I think I definitely resonate with everything that you all said. Um, originally, when I um, heard about the question, I was thinking about curiosity. Um, the curious to learn, curious about science, curious about knowledge, curious about, yeah, the curiosity. And But then as you all talking, I resonated with what you all said. And I also want to add that, well, it's just an element coming from me that I feel like it's very, I feel very grateful to have good mentors and there's no perfect mentor. And there are a lot of ups and downs when I interact with my mentors, but I really appreciate that I had very good mentors along the way. Thank you. Um, and so since Boy and I relatively recently finished graduate school and Spencer and Nuhia are going through it right now, what are some of the challenges you faced along the way and how, how did you handle that or are still handling that? Um, I think the biggest thing for me was very specific to me. Uh, the culture shock was really enormous. Um, as just mentioned, I didn't think I was going to get to go to college. I come from a background of poverty. And that is not the statistical majority at graduate school. And the shift was fairly extreme uh, culturally, uh, vibe-wise. Uh, the things that people are prioritizing are completely different. Um, we talk a lot about having differences of perspective being important, obviously, because that improves our science because the things that we think about are different and the ways we think about them are different. But it has also been a cultural uh, shift, I would say, um, now being in the graduate school environment. I'd say that's definitely been the biggest challenge so far, which honestly could be a lot worse. W would you say that that set you behind and it was something that really took you time to overcome? Or do you feel like it kind of, with the like overwhelming everything that is graduate school, it was just kind of one more thing you had to deal with? I would say it is an ongoing underlying discomfort that is starting to fade. Um, I've been very lucky to have a fairly smooth and comfortable graduate experience so far. Um, I've really stepped into the academic environment really comfortably. So there haven't really been any challenges there. And so the biggest thing is that underlying um, current of, um, I'm trying to think of the right phrasing for it, like cultural alienation. But again, it's fading. It's just a slow process. Was there something different you're doing that's making it fade away? Or is that just your natural part of the process? I think it's just a natural part of the process. I think that um, as time goes on, uh, I don't feel super comfortable taking this concept for myself, but there's a there's an idea of code switching where you change your behaviors or your the way that you interact with people based on the expectations of the people that are around you. And I feel like that is getting easier as time goes on. That was a really like good perspective and act, like Spencer I'm really glad you're here because like we talked about bringing perspective but like that's not a perspective that often gets told in grad school let alone like on a podcast about science so I appreciate that I think especially for poverty it's there isn't a look for poverty it's very hard to look at someone and go ah yes you were poor and so it is a lot harder to know that there is a community out there of other grad students and other people who've had successful careers who also have come from the same background. So I think it's one of those things that's really important to bring up and talk about. Mine is more of like just accepting the natural part of the process uh, because there's like older graduate students who will tell you, oh, literature review, this part of it was a little bit difficult. Or when I was learning this process, that was really difficult. So you think because you've heard all the things that can go wrong, that you're not going to make those mistakes. But I think it's accepting that you still have to fall into those ruts and have those like really uncomfortable periods of, I don't know what I'm doing. And sometimes it's like weeks on end or even months, right? And this is not something I had ever experienced before because the pace of an undergrad 
curriculum is like semester by semester, you're always on the move. So that's again, like being uncomfortable, being like, okay with being not comfortable. Um, that's kind of like an ongoing challenge. It's mostly just getting better with trying to recognize that everybody goes through this. And just because I know it, I won't escape it. But yeah, that's been sort of my struggle. For, for me, kind of on a more practical level, these have been like great philosophical thoughts on grad school. But for me, like just like time management and knowing how many projects you can say yes to is a uh, like it was a big struggle in grad school and an ongoing struggle for me like as a graduate student you have so many people like throwing ideas at you and you really have to decide like which ones do I have the time to follow up on when do I have to say no um and how can I manage my time such that I actually get enough done to graduate in the time that I want to graduate um, while also not, you know, quote unquote slacking, cause like people want to see productivity. So you have to, it's this really tough balance. And then like, you're often supervising undergraduates or master's students as well. And you have to manage their time, their projects. And so it's this kind of first step into working on something bigger than yourself. Like when you, when you're an undergrad, like maybe you have like a group project, but then you're, you're working among equals, um, to accomplish a goal. Whereas here, like you start to get these like hierarchies where like you're suddenly responsible for somebody. And that's been a really hard adjustment for me um, to be able to feel responsible for other people's times and feel like I can confidently tell them we need this and it's going to forward the project in this way. So again, like ongoing thing, it's not just grad school, but it really started there. I think for me, the biggest challenge I'll say is the feeling of being alone. I think being alone can be in many ways to different people. It can You can feel alone when you're working on your project. If you do not have any collaborators, then you, you, you're only, it's only you and your advisor. That's a sense of alone. And there can be many different forms of being alone. For me, being alone is actually, now I'm thinking, it's, um, it's a theme in my graduate school experience. I... I had a chemistry major in undergrad, and I was interested in, in DNA computing. Um, and I, at that time, I was in China, but I, and I know that the groups who are working on DNA computing are mostly were mostly in the U.S. at that time. So I need to go to U.S. So I was, in that sense, I was along in the sense that I was a Chinese student and wanting to go to US, working specific on DNA computing related projects. Um, and the program I went in was initially biochemistry. And, but the biochemistry program was a very, I was thinking it was a very, um, I'll say fundamental science themed instead of engineering themed. So I was along in the sense that most of the people around me were working on understanding how biology works, but I have an engineering mindset. I would like to engineer something out of molecules. Um, I was also along in the sense that nobody in the university, well, most of the, I, well, the group I was in was the only group in the program that has something to do with DNA. Um, I was also along in the sense that um, I failed my qualifying exam in the biochemistry program. Um, one of the reasons was also related to the difference between engineering versus studying biology. Then I was along in the sense that I really wanted to work with David Soloveitchik and he is in electrical and computer engineering pro program. So in order to keep working with him, I had to switch program to electrical and computer engineering. So I was along that I had to take a lot of new classes, graduate level classes to satisfy um, the, the new requirements. I didn't have a bachelor's degree in electrical computer engineering. And in order to strengthen my background, I, had, I, I felt the urge to go to, to take some undergrad classes. So I was along being the only graduate student in an undergrad class. Then there are also along that I was the first student 
in my advisor's group. That's a sense of feeling alone for a while until another student come in. I was the only female student in the group. I was the only experimental student in the group. And yeah, I was the only Asian student in the group for a while. So this kind of feeling alone was all along my graduate student journey. And maybe that's why I joined Mopix, because I was searching for a sense of connection. And I don't think I handled it pretty well. I suffered a lot in my graduate sc school. And for all the students who feel that they're alone, they can listen to a podcast and reach out to a community to not suffer from the feeling of feeling alone. And, and what gave you the strength to get through that? Like Anuhia said earlier, you had a lot of moments there of feeling like you were the, you know, dumb person in the room. How did you get over that? And how did you push through that feeling? I think um, I remember the time when I, I think that memory was in like 2016. That was um, the first semester I switched to electrical and computer engineering program. I went I went to a class, a discrete math class, and I was there. Actually, I find a moment of peace when I joined that class because all other students were freshmen. So I was alone, but I was not alone. I was the same as them, as naive as them. So I was alone, but not alone. And also, and actually, I felt more alone when I was with other students who have solid computer science background. That was, yeah, I'll say that was the way for me to reach out to the group that I feel a little bit more comfortable. And also, um, I was interested in the topic. The topic excites me. That's another motivation for me. And then there's also one important thing is um, I felt a connection to the research that my PhD advisor was working. So I really wanted to be good at doing what I wanted to do. That's a drive for me. I feel like you put into words really beautifully what, what a lot of graduate students go through, um, but you have like the gift of looking back at it and being like, oh, I actually did not handle it well. And that's something I feel like you could only get it in retrospection. Um, that feeling of being alone, from my perspective, like it's also what everybody says, it's like every graduate student's journey is their own journey, right? Just like any person's journey through life is their own journey. There's not really a comparison between, say, like me and you, right? But in graduate school, it feels a lot more difficult when, uh, say, there's other labs that are producing papers a lot faster and you're like, oh, I should have had a paper by now. or um, you know, everybody's going through their own thing, but it's hard to disconnect yourself from that comparison, right? Um, and I think maybe that's where all this aloneness comes from. So thank you for putting that really beautifully. So moving on from the topic of being alone to the topic of kind of being together. So a couple of weeks from now is DNA 30, or like 30th conference of DNA computing. Um, I don't know if this podcast will come out before the conference or maybe like during the conference, but everybody except for me on this podcast is going to be there. Is this anybody's first conference or has everybody been to previous conferences in this field or in other fields? Um, and on top of that, like, what are you looking to get out of meeting the rest of our community spread across the globe as it is? Tying very directly into the aloneness um, I went to DNA 28. It was my first DNA specific uh, conference. And I made a lot of friends there, friends that I'm really excited to see again. I'm excited to see Hannah. I'm excited to see Don. I'm excited to see a whole bunch of people that I met last year uh, or two years ago, sorry, and just reconnect. Um, I'm planning on hosting a board game evening, that kind of thing. And it seems a little silly to go, oh, this is our great conference to disseminate our research and be like, oh, the thing I'm excited for is to see my friends. But I think that really is a critical aspect of conferences. Um, it is a chance to meet people and talk to them about their work and interact with them and see what they're up to. I think building that international community is one of the strongest 
aspects of this field because we're so small it is possible to know everyone um and so i'm very excited to go this year and see my friends again so this one's going to be my first dna related conference and also my first in-person conference so and to be honest all the online conferences i've been to um I actually do not want to consider them my conference experiences because it was mostly just me presenting my work. And as much as I tried to focus on other people's presentations, it was very disconnected. And most of the times I feel like at least, like Spencer said, it's the human connection, right? Like you see something on a poster that you like, you go and talk to them. I had no way to do that unless I wanted to like email them. But I, so I'm really excited to see people in person. Uh, And I went through all the DNA 30 um, like schedule and I recognize the first thing that I'm really excited about is I recognize a lot of words compared to the previous conferences I've been where it's been like slightly related. Uh, I recognize a lot of names because I've been sort of like maybe fangirling over their papers. Uh, So yeah, I'm actually really looking forward to my first conference experience, I guess. My first conference, my first DNA conference was DNA 21. That one was in Harvard. And I remember I was very excited because I don't know if you um, have that kind of celebrity crush when you were young as a kid. I feel that it's like, I was so excited to see those professors where I only, when I only read those papers and, you know, or maybe see the pictures online, but the first time I could see the real person I was very excited, but at the same time, it brings a lot of nervousness. Oh, um, yeah, it's, it's really just like seeing a celebrity crush as a kid. Um, and I think I, I was a very shy person at that time, and it was not easy to, new, to get to know new people. And the only way I think I... It took me a lot of courage to talk to Dominic, Dominic Scalis, who was also on our podcast before, and he was a year ahead of me, and um, I talked to him at the post during the poster session. Yeah, it took me a lot of courage, and I think I also met Tian Chi, who is a postdoc right now at Lulu's lab, um, and also. But then, other than that, most of the time I was just spending time with people who I knew, and I didn't. I didn't use it as a good opportunity to know more more people. Um, but that was what I could do at that time. And I also tried to I try to look smart than I thought I were. By like for example, taking notes on the presentation or do things like that. I, I felt like I was trying to make myself look smart, even though I don't think I really get that much from a lot of talks based on the level I was at at that point. And then um, it was fun. I, I, I took it at, it, it's also a travel experience and gra- free travel student experience for graduate students. So it's good. It's also a free travel experience where you get to like meet a lot of random friends. And for those of us who are like a little bit shy, it's kind of like that thing that you keep hearing about, you know, all these Europeans who like, travel to like thailand or something and then they like meet a bunch of people in their hostel and they go out together and like they do all these things it's like i as like a shy little i'm not gonna say introvert because i don't think that accurately describes me but as like a shy little awkward child i do not get that experience but when i go to conferences i do because everybody else is just as weird as i am and like i have a question i could ask everybody what do you do um and it just makes it makes and yes, it's a nice social crutch that makes it really easy to talk to everybody, to meet everybody. Um, and just everybody's so excited. I, I really like it. Um, I just got back from the Artificial Biology Conference in Aarhus, Denmark. And it's kind of the same experience as going to the DNA conference in that it's like this relatively small field. Everybody knows everybody. A fair number of like DNA nanotech people were there as well. Um, and just... One thing I appreciate about all these kind of small conferences is you get these opportunities to talk to big names uh, that you may not get to if you go to like those big meetings like ACS or something. Um, you know, I remember two years ago at DNA 28, I like cornered Eric Winfrey and asked him some questions about 
uh, kind of abstractions in DNA computing. And like that conversation formed the basis for my textbook chapter in the Art of Molecular Programming book coming soon. Um, so those little like connections end up making a lot of things out of your career. And actually, I just realized that every job I've had since grad school has come from a conference connection. I had a con contract job, which came from a conference connection at an RNA nanotechnology conference pre-pandemic. Um, and my current postdoc position I got because I cold emailed a professor whose talk I liked at a FNano conference a couple of years ago. So those connections really matter. And like, this is how you can kind of move through the field. So do you guys have any advice for me specifically, I guess, since this is going to be my first conference and I'm pretty nervous and excited? Come to my board game evening. <laughs> I'm there. That is good advice. I, I would say like, if you're offered like any sort of social event, take it. When you go to like the conference lunch, try to sit where you know like one person at a table, but don't know the rest of them. Cause that way you have like one person that you can talk to and you kind of know what their deal is, but then you're also going to meet other people. And at conferences, people tend to be like pretty willing to like kind of jump into and out of conversations because everybody's doesn't know everybody else and everybody's kind of talking about the same thing. So building those kind of social situations where you are both comfortable yet able to meet lots of new people are really how you're going to make the most out of meeting all the people at the conference. I wish somebody told me that. <laughs> That's actually really good advice. I'm going to follow it. Moving from our conferences into kind of the field more broadly, um, why are you guys excited about molecular programming? Why are you here? I like molecular programming because I think um, interesting. This field, it, molecular programming, is in a very big term DNA nanotech, and I was actually I was um, got into DNA nanotech by using DNA as an engineering material for to engineer things, but not specific on computing part. But I, but what got me interested in is the com DNA computing part. So I, I think, um, and then thinking about my um, experience in graduate school and the research that my PhD advisor was working on. I think that the part that excited me most was actually the connection between molecules and math and computer science. And that, I think that working with my PhD advisor really ignited the hidden passion for, in, of math in me. And by like thinking about, I was a chemistry major as a bachelor degree and I just forget about math for a very long time. But I was, I really, I was really into it when I was in middle school. But because of teacher issues, I ask the issues, those kind of things can be get hidden or suppressed. But I really appreciate that my PhD advisor, he brought that part out of me and make me really interested in molecular programming to see the connection between molecules, which I had knowledge on, versus the math that I was in myself. That's, that's kind of similar to what I like. I really like the interdisciplinarity of it. Um, like you said, you can connect DNA, this chemistry thing, to math. And I come from the other direction. So I was a biology major and also geology originally. But what I really liked was this concept that you could build things with biology that didn't necessarily look like biology. But at the same time, you had to understand, you know, the math and the engineering of building things. You know, we have to build things out of these helical turns. We have these constraints on our building materials. You have to understand that. That's chemistry. That's math. But then like, we're using biological material. It means we can interface with biology. Um, and so you have to know biology. And it just kind of, it worked with the way that my brain kind of fit everything together. It's like, oh, everything's part of like this bigger whole system of the universe. Um, and we can engineer this one little part with such precise control that we can make machines that interface with other stuff. And I just think that is so cool. Uh Mine is going to be a more of a superficial answer, uh, which is that it feels really sci-fi. And when I tell people I'm working with DNA origami, they're like, what the hell is that? And I'm like, I take DNA and then I fold it up and I can code it on the computer. But on another level of that is that you have to really cleverly devise your experiments to be able to learn what's happening. Because I have a mechanical engineering background, and most of the things that I have worked with, I can see, I can hold, I can touch, right? So if a DNA was like a meter long, we'd be able to tell like what the tension is, what the twist is. But since it's so small and you can't see it, 
you have to use these like special machinery and then you have to learn how to interpret it because it ju- it's not that it just shows you what it is, right? Like you do gels on it and then it gives you that, oh, the population might be of this way. And then you do AFM where you only see like certain small populations. How do you put that together, right? Um, it's It's just a lot of clever experiment planning it's almost like you're tricking nature. God was like, you're not supposed to see on this scale. And then you're like, well, you bet I'm going to try it anyways, you know? So it's it's that level of like cleverness that I really enjoy participating in and just being wowed by when other people actually do it. Like the basis of AFM, right? Like who thought it was like, we're just going to use the repulsion that's like on electronic level, like on the level of electrons. And then we're going to use that to go across a substrate and see uh, structures. Like that's such an outlandish idea, right? So yeah, this is kind of the stuff that excites me a little bit. My father-in-law was visiting the lab recently and I explained AFM as the world's most detailed and expensive vinyl record player. You're not wrong. (laughs) That's amazing. I'm going to use that when I ever explain it ever again. <laughs> it really it really captures the basic idea. Um, I am really a creative. I think of myself as a, like I do art work all the time. And I think that molecular programming is in a point right now as a very new field where the creative opportunities are infinite. There are so many options. There's it, We aren't at the position yet where we're just trying to figure out like, oh, here's this small nuance about this one specific protein. We aren't at that point yet. Everything that we're doing right now is still really, really, really big. And uh, I think that that's a really exciting path of opportunity, especially as someone who isn't particularly invested in applications. Um yeah, I think that's the really thing that grabs me about molecular programming is the creative opportunities. And you, you kind of brought up that idea of we're, we're in the space of big picture ideas right now. Um, and kind of on that note, does anybody have a favorite paper or like couple papers that they want to like share with the community and say like, I think these are the coolest things we did? The first paper I ever read was a paper from Darko Stefanovic. And it was about um, it was the, one of the Maya papers where they have a enzyme based logic set of logic gates that plays tic tac toe. And as someone who'd never heard of this field before, I was doing neuroscience at the time. I was so inspired by the just the creativity and the sense of fun that came with that. Look, it's molecules that we've taught to play an extremely human thing. Tic tac toe is a very human thing. There is not a analogy to tic tac toe in nature. But we've taken these molecules and now they can play tic-tac-toe. Mine is more of like on an experimental front. And I just love how beautiful of a paper it is and how simple of a paper it is uh, to understand. And it's uh, this paper uh, about isothermal assembly of DNA origami. Until now, we always use like annealing ramps, right? Because we want to avoid like kinetic traps in our structures. And the paper is like, well, switch out your magnesium with sodium chloride and your kinetic trap structures are not held as tightly, I guess. So you're able to just incubate them at room temperature and, I don't know, have them form. And what's really beautiful about that paper is that they go with that one, like, switch, but then they really rigorously... uh, show that it works with multiple kinds of structures at multiple multiple different times it's just a beautifully organized paper that's like a that's the kind of paper i'd like to put out someday and it's really prescient with a lot of people switching over to these isothermally folded rna origamis which like kind of cheat because they're single stranded instead of having these you know hundreds of strands and kinetic problems that dna origamis have but like isothermal seems to be the thing that people are into right now Mm -hmm. um maybe to make things easier to produce, easier to interface. And some structures have really crazy annealing ramps where it's like, not only do you have to anneal like up to down one time, maybe you have to ramp it back up. And a lot of the times people don't really know why, but I like, well, it's the kinetic traps, but like a lot of the times figuring out those annealing ramps is also just experimental. 
I mean, so there are those two back-to-back -back science paper from Peter Schultz and Tim Liedel's lab a couple months ago showing like assembly of crystal phases that like solid state physicists believe to be impossible to nucleate using DNA. And I think in both cases, I, I know the Schultz lab one much better than the Liedel lab one for obvious reasons. Um, but I think they ended up like zigzagging the temperature right around the critical nucleation temperature because they wanted to make sure they got like single crystal seeds that then started growing instead of nucleating tons and tons of little seeds. You have to like nucleate, drop the temperature just a little bit, and then kind of bounce the temperature up and down to knock misassembled origamis off the edges of the crystal. And so you only got perfectly assembled crystal. And they did this for days. That's actually, that's pretty cool. So it's cool what you can get out of it, but like, you don't even want to know how long it took them to figure out what that temperature was and exactly the ramp they had to use. My favorite paper was actually, it's my favorite because, because of my history, because how much the paper impacted me. Um, the, first, the first paper that I put a lot of focus on was Lulu and Eric's paper, um, Scaling Up Digital Circuits, and that was a 2011 science paper. That paper was my f f favorite because um, my first research project in my undergrad was related to that paper, utilized something in that paper. Um, inspired by that paper. And so it became my favorite because I had to read it a lot in order to try to trying to understand it. And other than the effort I put in in trying to understand it, make it my favorite, and also there are some the elements in the paper also um really um made me enjoy. For example, how um, the figures are drawn, the colors they choose, and how they present the data and how long the supplemental documentation is and um and how the how the paper is organized i think there's so many elements in how a paper is written that made me enjoy reading that paper and made me form kind of taste of what kind of paper i like and what kind of paper i want to produce so yeah that's i really like that paper um because of all of them above and it's, I would say I use the word beautiful, but beautiful is very subjective. But it's it's a feeling that um, I enjoy. That's it. I think we can all appreciate like a good beautiful paper. Um, and I think on mine, it's also kind of a beautiful paper that I want to talk about because it kind of inspired so many things in the application side. I'm talking about the 2019 paper from Bjorn Hogbert's lab where they looked at the spatial tolerance of antibodies using DNA origami as like this nano patterning substrate. And I really like this because this is really the first paper I can point to that is studying something of like hardcore biological relevance using like something that came out of molecular programming. You know, I've, I've often heard our field referred to as a solution in search of a problem. And like, this is a problem where I can point to and say, we did it. We, we, we found a like, we found a problem that our solution applies to. So, I, I mean, I love kind of useless, beautiful research, but when I'm talking to other people, I love to be able to bring up this paper. And then it's the kind of follow-up papers from the Hogberg lab and the Bathe lab and the Xi lab, where they, they showed the way that antigen spacing affects uh, B cell and T cell activation, kind of leading up to the uh, vaccine papers that the Xi lab is working on now, where they look at the way that antigen spacing affects immune cell activation, and then use that to design a vaccine that has kind of swappable antigens and swappable um, adjuvant properties. And I, I just think that whole sequence of events is so cool, the way things build on each other from, okay, we can nano pattern now that we have DNA origami, to we can put things on the DNA origami and they change their binding affinity, to, oh, this also works on cells, to, okay, now we can go back to the engineering I just, I just love that sequence of um, scientific development. And I think that is, is so beautiful, the way that the field has kind of taken that idea and run with it and made so many beautiful things. Now that we're kind of getting towards the end of our, our podcast time here, I kind of want to move toward the future. Um, and part of being a scientist is always learning something. So what is it that you guys are most excited to learn next? Is it something within the field of DNA origami or DNA computing? Is it something from outside the field? like? What excites you about the next five years of your research? What are we going to be learning? 
very immediately I'm about to start using uh, single stranded tiles for a lot of what I'm trying to do. And so directly and immediately, I'm excited to learn more about single stranded tiles and how to use them and how to uh, use experiments using them. But in the longer run, I don't have a computer science background, but I've been really fascinated and interested in theoretical computer science. And uh, this is a totally new avenue for me. I'm very fresh to it, but so far it seems to be coming to me fairly easily and it has been extremely enjoyable to learn about. Well, this one is more specific to me and my project, but I wanna understand crystal assemblies better. And I know there's a lot of literature, a lot of background work out there that I can use to learn, but I just, I think it would help me uh, or give me more insights in how like multiple DNA can actually come together uh, in solution. So yeah, that's my trajectory. Something that keeps coming up kind of in my research and in my life are viroids. Uh, so these are small pieces of RNA that are somehow able to infect plants. They're, they're not protected. They don't code for proteins. They're just like these parasitic RNA sequences. Um, so I'm kind of excited to learn more going back into the basic biology and looking at how maybe we can either use molecular programming to study basic biology or take idea, like do some more bioprospecting, steal things from viroids and add them into RNA origami. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in this idea. And as I'm like starting to think about maybe applying for my own grants, this is something that I'm like looking forward to um, and maybe using. So what do viroids do actually? I've never heard of them before. They sound cool. Um, so they're small fragments of RNA between three and 400 bases. They don't have any protein coding sequences. Um, it's not entirely clear how they get into plant cells. They seem to get in via like physical lesions. Um, and then once in, they basically hijack the plant's transcription machinery and just make a ton of copies of themselves. And for some reason, this totally throws off the plant physiology and you get really like stunted dead plants. Um, but this is a little bit of an understudied part of biology. We don't know why they work. We don't know um, how they transport through plants to some extent. Like we, we know they bind to certain proteins and maybe those help chaperone them through, uh, oh crap, what's the plant word for the things that connect the cells? Is it desmosomes? Something like that. Um, and so they're just fascinatingly simple pieces of molecular machinery that hijack biology in really fascinating ways. And I'm really curious as to how they work and what we already know about them versus what we don't. So the original question was like, where where do we want to, what do we want to learn? Where do we want to go in five years? I think my initial response was, I don't know. And I think it's okay to not knowing for a while. And, and then if I think more about it, I think it's very first. It's very exciting to hear all of you speaking about um, what you are interested in learning, and um, it's exciting to hear that. And I think what I want to bring up is um, some uh, thoughts outside of academia. Um, I think that a lot of students or postdocs, when they were inside of academia, they um, they didn't. Some of them may not um, have the courage to look outside of academia. And especially if people around them are always talking about how fascinating it is to do research, to stay in, to stay in their field, it's, it can, well, also create another feeling of feeling alone and not know what to do and where to go next and feel very lost. I think I would like to encourage um, everyone to um, talk to people and see what's out there other than the academia research, this path, which is the uh, traditional path. And, it, it's, and, and it's easy to be on this path because there's a very clear role model. For example, your advisor is there, who is on this path and who can guide you on this path. Um, but life has so many opportunities. I mean, there, there's, it's always good to look around to see what's out there. For me, I do not know where I wanna go next, I think, Science is exciting, it's interesting, and but there's also things outside of science. There are also different interesting options there. And finally, one, one last question. Um, we've talked a lot about how we hope that by doing these podcasts, by doing the reading groups, um, by holding events at conferences, we can form a more 
connected molecular programming community. Um, what are you looking for in that more connected community? And maybe Boya can even talk about like, what are we looking for if we connect outside the community? I don't know if anybody has any thoughts. Not to be cliche and say networking is everything, but it really is everything. Um, I will be bold and say that I'm an introvert. I definitely 100% am. But even still, um, I think a connected molecular programming community is one that everyone knows somebody else who is an expert in the thing that they want to know. If I have something that I need to know about something that I know exactly who to reach out to, and I've already met them, and I already know them, and it's an easy thing to do. And I really think that Molepig's taking a more social angle on things uh, is a great opportunity to make that happen. Um, for me, I think I uh, want to echo what Boyo said, which is like, if you're surrounded by people in academia, it's a lot harder to sort of see the other side of things. In undergrad, it's a little bit more open, right? Because you're there for career explorations. So the university kind of throws at you like, uh, they're like corporate partnerships and there's like professors in the school that you can talk to. So it's a very like, like inherently explorative place. But I feel like in grad school kind of gets lost a little bit and it's a lot uh, up to you what you do and who you talk to, which is a great thing I should be taking like into my own hands who I'm meeting and who I'm talking to. But it can also take a backseat really easily when other things come up in life. So yeah, like I really want to see more networking events. Uh, and as someone who's also very shy and scared all the time uh, of making like a fool of myself or appearing stupid, a little bit of a casual networking format would be really chill. Uh, so that's kind of where I see what I see would be helpful for at least like early career researchers like me. Wait, early career is a wrong word. I think early career researchers are like professors, like, right? So it's like. I usually, usually early career means like PhD to postdoc, I think. Oh, really? Okay. I'm with you on that one, Anu. Yeah, I don't feel early career. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like pre-early career. What do you guys want out of Mulpigs? Or where do you want it to go? I mean, I, I kind of, like Spencer said, networking is everything. Um, I would really like to see kind of m somehow building a more actively engaged community, like especially on our Slack channel. For those of you who listen and aren't part of it yet, there's a Slack channel you can sign up on our website. Um, and I, I've seen some really great like question and answers there is that people have problems and they find somebody in the field who like has an answer. Um, I want to see more people asking questions and more people sharing their research. Um, I know it's like one more thing to throw on everybody's plate. But I think that intercommunity connection and that ability to leverage the whole community as a resource is really the benefit of having these organizations that are kind of more casual than something like Essence, where you know they organize conferences and they have like a job board, but it's not it's not casual. So I, I really hope that we can have more casual, more connected, more interfaced, more networked community. I think it will be nice to have to make Mopix the platform that when people um, think that, oh, they have a question or they have a problem they don't know how to solve, they ask around their lab members, they do not know who to go, who, they do not know how to solve it. Then Mopix is the immediate next thing that they can think about. Oh, I can ask or I can find resources there, can get help there from Mopix. That would be great. This is the first time that DNA30 is coming. And it's the first time for many years I see a, um, a very formal connection between the field of molecular community molecular programming to the industry field there is a the fifth day i believe on the conference is specific for that connection this is this is the first time and i'm i don't know how it's gonna be but i'm very excited i think this could be a uh connection between a lot of uh, the science part to the industry part and that is also a very good sign showing that our field is um there, there are many people in the field or outside the field are trying to um, utilize the technology we build to find connection applications where to, to give more opportunities for students. So um, I'm excited about that. And maybe I'll see how it goes. And maybe in the future, Mopix can also uh, build some connections to those industrial sides of 
partners. That's really, really exciting to hear. And for all three of you, like, watch out for potential podcast guests. So anybody who like speaks really excitedly and with passion, like grab them after their talk and tell them like, hey, we've got a podcast. You want to come on? Um, let's line up the next few guests at this conference. Um, so with that, unless anybody has anything else to say, I think this is the end of our kind of panel discussion here. So the last thing I wanted to talk about is kind of some upcoming Mopex events. So at DNA 30, like I said, I hope this podcast comes out before the conference. Um, we're going to be setting up a table where we're going to do kind of scientific hot takes on the spot, short little questions, and hear from the whole community instead of just one guest trying something new. Um, we also will hopefully have some swag to hand out at the conference. So look out for Boya, Nuhia, and Spencer. They might have things for you. Um, and also a few weeks after the conference ends, we will start our next reading group. Our plan is to do kind of the history of DNA origami, um, everything from Paul Rothman's paper through larger, more complex, more fiddly ways to build large DNA structures. So we hope to see many of you there. If you're not already signed up for our newspaper, you can do that at our website, molpi.gs. Um, you, can, you can join our Slack channel, sign up for the newsletter. We'll send out the sign up link for the reading group through that. Um, and that's the end of the podcast. Thank you for joining us. And thank you to the rest of the team for having brilliant ideas. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you. you. MOLPIGS is supported by ISSENCE, the International Society for Nanoscale Science, Computation, and Engineering, and Hannah Early, one of our founding members. Our editor is Autumn Anderson. The MOLPIGS team is... Oya Wang. Eric Poppleton. Anuhia Irubuganti. And Spencer Winter. Check out our website at molpi.gs, where you can find links to sign up for our newsletter and join our Slack channel to connect with the community and never miss an episode. See you next time.